Marriage is a wonderful blessing from God. But here's the thing. Again, some people decide that they want to change up what marriage actually means. I remember an occasion between a couple of actors in Hollywood. Uh, they got married and they said, well, we're going to get married, but we're actually going to see other people while we're married. That's not what the marriage covenant looks like. It's a, that, that's a, well, that's a violation of what God sees a marriage as. Matter of fact, what we see is marriage is a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman. Romans 7 verse 2. Turn over there if you will. Romans chapter 7 and verse 2. Verse 3 is, is good there as well, but we'll just look at verse 2 this afternoon. Romans chapter 7 verse 2. It says, for the married woman is bound by law. Whose law? It's talking about God's law. She is bound by God's law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. Till you know, we have those vows. Married, married people have those vows. Till death do you part. And this is important, folks, for each and every one of us, whether we're married or single. It's important that we listen to these things. Because as we go through this subject, one of the big things is what those of us who may be single, those who are here that are single, you may one day find a spouse. And so you need to be listening to this as well as we go through this subject. But once again, it's a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman. If you're dating someone and you find out, or rather, when you're dating someone and you're, you're dating them and you realize they probably aren't the proper person to be married to, then you probably don't need to be married to Marry them. If they're not going to treat marriage as a lifelong commitment, they're probably someone you need to avoid. But if you continue on, just one final thing on that. Homosexuality is excluded from this. A lot of people, the American nation back in, I believe it was 2012, the, uh, the Supreme Court said that, well, now everyone in the United States can get married with same-sex marriage. Male with male, female with female. That is not the marriage covenant. That is not how God designed it. Again, Genesis 2 verse 24 says, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. God didn't create. I know some people like to joke about this, but God didn't create Adam and Steve or uh, Stephanie and Eve. He created Adam and Eve. That tells you right now how God designed the marriage relationship to be between one man, one woman, once again, for life. Matter of fact, when you look at this subject of marriage, one of the things you see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, is it says a man shall be joined together with his wife. Some of your translations shall be bound to his wife. Some say, hold fast to his wife. And here's the thing. What does that word exactly mean? Hold fast. Be joined to. Well, the Greek word, well, the Hebrew word, if I can pronounce it correctly, is debak, which means to join together, adhere. You hear of, you know, of adhesive tape, adhesive glue. You remember those kind of words? And as well as glue. According to Strong's definition. Imagine, the, the marriage covenant is a gluing together of a husband and wife in this commitment. Now with the Greek word that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 19 verse 5, Vines defines it with all that in mind, but then it adds in the word cement. Think about that for a moment. A marriage relationship is where a man and a woman join in a cemented commitment with one another. With a, they, they cement themselves together in the marriage covenant. You know, that means that should be something that's hard to break apart. And so many people do it without another thought. So many people get divorced without another thought. 
And that leads us into our second subject this afternoon, and that is, well, actually, we haven't gotten there yet. I'm getting ahead of myself. But when we look at marriage, and we look at the subject of marriage even further, we see that both the husband and the wife have duties to one another. When we, and we have responsibilities to one another, the husband's responsibility. Let's just look at some uh, scriptures for this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 7. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, this is what God would say to the husband. Or, well, this is what Peter would say to husbands. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Live with someone who is weaker than you. Show her honor. Show her uh, honor as a fellow heir of the gospel. That's, that's what Peter would write to folks. That's part of our responsibility as husbands. Ephesians 5 is another really good passage. He's comparing uh, the marriage relationship, or rather he's comparing the relationship Christ has with the church to the marriage between a man and a woman. Look over to Ephesians chapter 5. Notice with me uh, verse 25. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5 let's start with verse 25 it says husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her notice that for a second and gave himself up for her he's someone that a husband is someone that needs to be one who is willing to make sacrifices look on to verse 28 so husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. That sounds kind of familiar. Skip on down to verse 33 with me. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. Where have we heard that phrase before? Loving someone as you love yourself. What's the second greatest commandment of the law? According to what Jesus said. What was he quoting there in Leviticus chapter 19? I believe it was verse 17 or 18. He said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so he's saying the same thing. He's saying, husbands, you need to be loving your wives as you love yourself. Almost, you know, to just kind of almost mimicking how we're supposed to love our neighbor. And part of that love, once again, is shown in being willing to make sacrifices. Single women, those of you who are might be dating, those of you who may be thinking about dating, when choosing a husband, if you're dating someone right now who is not putting you first, no, I'm not talking about putting you first about above God. I'm talking about putting you first in this life, putting God first and then making being willing to make sacrifices for you as a firm second, I guess. If he's not willing to make those kind of sacrifices for you while you're not married, do you think he's going to be willing to do it while you are married? Just something to think about. Another good passage that shows the duty the husband has to the wife is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 says, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. All of this is pointing to the fact that the husband's body belongs to the wife, not to a someone you're going to commit adultery with. Because that's, of course, a sin, and we're going to talk about that here in a moment. It belongs to the wife. It doesn't belong to someone who's not your wife. You move on from there. Let's look at the wife's responsibility. Let's look back at 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice verses 1 through 6. 
Now that we've seen that the husband's responsibility is to love his wife as Christ loved the church, being willing to make sacrifices for his wife. Let's look at the wife's responsibility in the marriage covenant. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, in the same way you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Some people get the wrong idea on this. They think that Peter, and Paul's going to say it in Ephesians as well, they're going to say, well, Peter and Paul are saying that the wives need to be willing to submit to physical abuse. That is not what they're saying at all. And we'll see more of that. We'll explain more about that here in a moment. But when it says be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. What's that saying? It's saying that sometimes the faithful wife can bring the, the unfaithful husband by her example. She can bring that unfaithful husband back to God. Verse 3, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if you do what is right." without being frightened by any fear. You see something similar being addressed in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. Turn over there if you will. Paul had similar words there in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. What's he saying there? You know, some people, well, let's actually finish this out with verse 33. Again, it talks about the husband, but then it continues with the wife. Nevertheless, each individual among you must also, excuse me, uh, you also is, <clears throat> excuse me. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. And the wife now, there's a second half to that verse, must see to it that she respects her husband. When you look at that particular passage, people say, well, and they, there's another misunderstanding that's in the church, and among other people in the world, they say, well, that word submission, that, that word submission there, says that the husband must love the wife, but the wife must submit to the husband. Does that mean that the wife doesn't love the husband? And maybe it's more of a misunderstanding than anything else. I've never really heard that concept taught before. But when you read that passage, the thing that's being misunderstood is that there's no love and submission. That is absolutely not true. This submission, this being subject to your husband, this is a great kind of love. This is a type of love that he's describing here. And sometimes there's different ways the Bible describes love. This is one of them. This is loving your husband enough to being willing to to submit to him and to put your life into his hands. Being loving enough to do that thing, do such a thing. That's what we're reading about here. This is something for single guys to think about. When choosing a wife, if the woman you're dating is not showing that submissive attitude and respect that we're reading about in 1 Peter 3, having that love to put her hand, her, her, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Put her life into your hands. If she's unwilling to show that submissive attitude, well, maybe she's not the right one for you. Looking over at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4, remember, the wife's body belongs to the husband, the husband's body belongs to the wife. It doesn't belong to someone else outside the marriage covenant. 
That's something we have to remember. So many people think that they can give it, uh, have their body given to someone else outside of that covenant, which is where adultery comes in. And we've just read about how wonderful marriage is. When the husband is fulfilling his duty and the wife is fulfilling her duty, this works. This whole entire concept that God set up works. But when one is not doing what they need to do, that's where marriages tend to fail. When both fail, marriages fail. When one fails, marriages tend to hit the more, you might say, rocky ground. This is supposed to be something that when you're working toward it and you're in harmony, the husband doing his duty, the wife doing her duty, this is a concept that's supposed to churn, I guess, for lack of a better word. And so, this is really a great blessing that God has given. He's given us something that actually works. He, the marriage covenant is supposed to be something that works when the duties, when the responsibilities of both spouses are being fulfilled. And so that's why the next thing we're going to talk about is so terrible. And that is the subject of divorce. Divorce is the idea of a separation or putting asunder. In Matthew chapter 19, notice with me verses 3 through 6. Matthew chapter 19, notice with me verses 3 through 6. It says, Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? She burns the toast, get out. She used up all the hot water, get out. She cooked the meal that you don't like this morning, get out. Any reason at all? Verse 4, Jesus answered and said, Have you not read that he who uh, created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. I think the King James there. Uh, King's, King James Version says, put asunder. I think there's a translation that says, rip asunder. And it's a separation. You think about this idea of what a separation is doing here. The marriage covenant is supposed to be something that's cemented. If you try to pull apart, if you manage to pull apart something that's been cemented together, what's that going to look like? What are the two ends going to look like? The, the two pieces you managed to break apart. They're not going to look all that nice. It's a very terrible thing when divorce happens. Matter of fact, there is one exception for divorce, and we'll get to that here in a moment. But we know for a fact that God hates unlawful divorce. By unlawful, I mean according to God's law. Some people like to say, well, as long as it's lawful in the sight of the government, the United States, Canada, Philippines, wherever. As long as it's okay, as long as it's lawful on the side of the government, it's okay. No. This is talking about God's law. Look over in Malachi chapter 2. Very last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. There's a big rebuke God is giving to these people the Jewish nation at this time. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness, because you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, but not one has done so, what has a, excuse me, who has a, rem a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth, Notice these next words, for I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. 
So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Point is, God hates unlawful divorce. That's something that needs to be understood. There's one exception to divorce, and that is sexual immorality, fornication. What well, we talked about this morning, remember, incest, bestiality, homosexuality, uh, sexual relations outside of the marriage covenant, all those things we talked about, uh, homosexuality, all of those things would be considered sexual immorality, fornication. Pornea was the word we looked at. And that, this is the one exception there is to divorce. Look over in Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5. Notice verses 31 through 32. Matthew chapter 5. Verses 31 through 32. It says, It was said, Whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman, it's adultery. Unchastity, I think we can see, and we're going to see it, I think, really defined in chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, as, once again, sexual immorality. <coughs> Look over in 19, verses 7 through 9. The conversation continued after verse 6 in Matthew chapter 19 between Jesus and the Pharisees. Beginning in verse Excuse me. Beginning verse 7. So after he's already told them what God has joined together, let no man separate. Let no man tear asunder, rip asunder. Verse 7, they said that, well, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Kind of see some, maybe a smart aleck attitude in this way they're responding. Well, what about when Moses said this? That's kind of how Satan worked. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? Doesn't it say in such and such a passage? Verse 8, he said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for, some translations say fornication, immorality, sexual immorality, the word here is pornea, except for immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Right there. It makes it very bluntly clear that this is the only exception to divorce is when you are the victim of an unfaithful spouse. That is the one exception. When the spouse decides to be unfaithful, any realm, anywhere in that realm of pornea, you have the right to divorce that spouse. Now, someone may be in a situation where they are unlawfully divorced. Well, what do you do then? Does God just kind of leave you there to just kind of, I guess a good word for that would be hover? Just kind of hover in nothingness trying to figure out, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. No, he gives an answer. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Notice with me verses 10 through 11. <clears throat> he gives... He tells people what they need to do when they've been unlawfully divorced. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 11 says, But to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. That's divorce right there. But if she does, not, but if she does leave, that's verse 11, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried. Or, be reconciled to her husband. She has two options. A person who is in an, unlawful, in an unlawful divorce, they have two options. Either remain unmarried or be reconciled to the one you divorced. Those are the only two options for the person who is unlawfully divorced. One who is, uh, and I, I neglect to use the word unscriptural, maybe anti-scriptural divorce would be a better one. But it goes against what God said. And so you only have two options at that point. <laughs> the sad truth of the matter is that in every divorce, at least one person has sinned. A lot of times both people are in sin when the divorce occurs. But usually one person is, has sinned. This is a very difficult subject to talk about. I have known brethren who have been the victims of a really 
terribly unfaithful spouse. It's always hard to comfort those brethren when they go through that situation. Something very difficult to talk about. But it must be understood that there are times when there is an innocent party who's been hurt in that divorce. And we need to be there for them. But again, sometimes both people are in sin. Both people decided maybe for, again, the unlawful reason to be divorced. Maybe both spouses cheated on each other. Maybe there was adultery on both sides. I've known of that to happen. In any situation, there's always at least one person who sinned, and sometimes it's both. Either it's one spouse or it's both spouses. And so that brings us to just say this. God's law is clear. He has told us who can be divorced. Or, uh, he, he tells us what kind of a divorce he accepts. And that's it. There's only one exception to that. That brings us to our third and final point concerning remarriage. Well, what about remarriage? Well, of course, widow folks may remarry. You remember Romans 7, verse 2? She is bound by law concerning her husband, but <clears throat> excuse me. But when her husband dies, she is free from the law concerning her husband. In other words, that binding that she has with her husband, the cementing is no longer there. Remember the phrase, till death do you part? I'm not even sure if that's even repeated in some ceremonies anymore. But widow folks may remarry. The scripture clearly makes that clear throughout. Especially here in Romans chapter 7, verse 2. But there's another exception. Or excuse me. There's another person. <clears throat> excuse me. There's another group of people that may remarry. And that is the one who divorces a spouse because their spouse committed adultery. Committed some kind of sexual immorality. Fornication. Pornia. That person may remarry. Again, about looking back over at Matthew 19, verse 9. Look over back over there, Matthew 19, verse 9. <clears throat> Excuse me. Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Let's look at what Jesus said one more time. He said, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for pornia, except for fornication, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. In other words, there is an exception if the divorce did not occur, or if the divorce occurred because of the sexual immorality, because fornication occurred. There's that one exception. Those are the only two exceptions God gives. Those are the only two uh, people who are allowed to be remarried according to the scripture. Those who are widowed and those who have been divorced for, who were a victim of having an unfaithful spouse. Those are the only two exceptions. Because it's made clear that unlawful divorce followed by remarriage is adultery. You look at Matthew 19 verse 9, we just read that. Clearly makes that point. Matthew 5, verse 32. Except it be for unchastity, it's adultery. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11. There's a reason why a person can't remarry after an unscriptural divorce. Because it would be, once again, adultery. The scripture lays that out. The scripture makes it clear. And we need to remember that. Looking at this final point, God created marriage to be between one man and one woman for life. Anything beyond that, some people believe in polygamy. Not very many, but a few. 
I've even known people in the Lord's Church to think it's okay to practice polygamy. One of them was a deacon years ago. I don't know what his thoughts are now. I haven't spoken to him in years. <clears throat> but again, God created marriage to be this covenant between one man and one woman for life. Divorce is a terrible thing to occur. If it's something that occurs when both people are guilty, it is a terrible thing because it's an unlawful divorce. It's a sinful divorce. And it's a terrible thing when it's occurring even for a scriptural reason. When it's occurring for a lawful reason. Because someone's been unfaithful and someone's been the victim of someone who was unfaithful. It's a terrible situation. Every divorce contains at least one person sinning. I know I've said that a lot, but that just simply is the truth. And lastly, just in summary for all this, remarriage is only permitted in the cases of the widow and those who are victims of an unfaithful spouse. To go beyond what God has said on any of these things is to really bring dishonor to marriage. It's not holding to what God has said marriage is supposed to be. It goes against what God's word says. Adds to what he says. Violates God's law concerning marriage. Marriage is supposed to be a great thing. Yet so many people disregard it Trample it underfoot like dirt. That's something that should not be named among God's people. We need to be obeying what God has said regarding marriage and the marriage covenant. We quoted Hebrews 13 verse 4 a couple times. Let's go ahead and go back over there. We quoted it earlier this morning. Let's just notice this as our final verse. Hebrews 13 verse 4. Hebrews 13, verse 4, marriage is to be held in honor by all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled. I think some translations actually say kept pure. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Those are the final words I'll leave with you this afternoon. Once again, we need to obey God's laws concerning marriage. We need to obey all of God's laws. Whether it be concerning marriage, whether it be concerning any other thing He's commanded us. But perhaps one had, there's someone here that has never decided to obey God's commands. Maybe you fall into some area which we've talked about this uh, afternoon. Maybe you've uh, you have become a Christian, but you've fallen away. It could be in the sin we've talked about today. It could be in some other sin. You can, like, you can return, get your heart right with God by coming forward, repenting of your sin, confessing your sin, and we'll pray to God for forgiveness on your behalf. But perhaps you have never become a Christian. Perhaps you have never decided to follow Jesus. Well, you can decide to do that this morning. Afternoon, I should say. I keep saying morning. It's only a few hours away from the morning. But, but if you need to get your heart right with God, there's no good reason to wait in doing so. We have no idea when the judgment day is going to occur. It could be today. If the, trump, if the trumpet of the Lord would sound right before the closing prayer, where would you be? Where would you spend eternity? If your heart is not right before God, get it right with Him today. If you need to obey the gospel, if you need to become a Christian, if you need to decide to follow Jesus, don't hesitate in doing so. You can do so by coming forward, believing in Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, and being baptized. If you need to get your heart right with God this afternoon, please don't hesitate. Do so right now as we stand and sing. Oh, do not let the word depart.